Welcome to the Stewardship Leader Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Stewardship Network. CSN exists to encourage, teach, and connect church and stewardship leaders to help them create and lead healthy stewardship ministries in their church. You can learn more about CSN at christianstewardshipnetwork.com. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Stewardship Leader. I'm your host, Leo Sabo. And today I have the pleasure of having a friend of the ministry. Art Rayner is the founder of Christian Money Solutions and the Institute for Christian Financial Health. He's the creator of Eight Money Milestones and the author of The Money Challenge. He and his wife live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they have three boys. Art, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with us today. Leo, it is always a pleasure to to be on your on your podcast, of course. Thank you for all that you do um, with Christian Stewardship Network and just the the massive influence that you have on ministry leaders and beyond. And so, yeah, it's it's a joy to be here. Well, thank you for taking the time, and you equally do some great work. So, we want to talk about what you're doing. You've been busy over the last year, year and a half or so since you've launched uh, the Christian Money Solutions. And of course, the Institute for Christian Financial Health is one of those efforts. Uh, you just recently put together a survey, uh, basically a report that I know you put a lot of work into it. So, we're going to talk about that. But tell us a little bit more about what you're doing through Christian Money Solutions before we get into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. God has allowed me to work in the area of my of my passion, which is to help people discover and pursue God's design for money, which is the mission behind Christian Money Solutions. That's what we want to do, help people discover and pursue God's design for money. Discover, help them understand what the Bible says about money, and then pursue, provide practical ways to, to do that. And so we've chased after that mission in a number of different ways. Uh, we have launched the Eight Money Milestones program, which you've already already mentioned, which is a small group, six week video based program that mostly is being used in the context of the of the local church, and that's really exciting to see people chase after those Eight Money Milestones. But then we also launched the Institute for Christian Financial Health. Now, this is kind of the the research and training arm of Christian Money Solutions. And out of the Institute for Christian Financial Health, I hope, hopefully I'm not confusing everybody already um, with, with all these details. I'm kind of nerding out here, right? Out of the Institute for Christian Financial Health, we have the Certified Christian Financial Counselor Program, that designation. And that program is to help train up an army of men and women who are passionate about helping people discover and pursue God's design for money. Now, a lot of the people who get into this program are using it as uh, as part of their private practice. So they do Christian financial counseling in a private practice setting. But what we also see are men and women using it in the context of the local church. So think of a marriage counselor. It operates in a very similar manner, except for this is Christian financial counseling. And so when individuals or couples in the church are struggling with their with their finances and they need to have a a conversation that goes beyond let's say the eight money milestones one that goes a little bit deeper than what can take place in a small group setting then they meet with a certified Christian financial counselor to have those deep money conversations with her, which are often connected to their to their hearts right they're often mm-hmm. spiritual co- conversations and so it's been fun to uh, to see that we actually have cert CFCs certified Christian financial counselors in 22 states across America right now. And uh, man, that's been exciting to see just how God has used that that program and that designation to once again further his his kingdom by helping people get financially healthy and uh, for the sake of of advancing God's kingdom. Yeah, I, I so appreciate you and everything you've done through that because what I recognize as a stewardship leader is that sometimes churches are just not as equipped to do that part of it because it's a yeah. what we call high time high touch relationship right it takes a long sometimes a long time to get people financially kind of right to ship so that may take months that may take maybe a year or two hmm. some of my cases of course lasted uh, well into the months yeah and you know when you're doing that in a church setting especially if you have a, a larger size church and you have families come into you it's hard to put together a group of volunteers that can mm-hmm. do that. And they're limited because they have families and you know, that's not their full-time gig. So 
uh, it could be very difficult to meet that need. But how great to have a financial counselor available in our church. Sometimes when people needed counseling, whether it was marriage counseling or other, the church would say, well, we don't have the capacity to do it, but we can pay for you to go to mm-hmm. a license, you know, because we feel like you need to go to a licensed counselor. And so that is a great resource that churches can use. And I so appreciate you putting that together. And I know it's something that is continuing to grow. And I love the fact that you're providing that resource. So I just want to reiterate that that's such a huge benefit to churches. So if, if a pastor or a leader is listening today and you don't have a coaching ministry, you may not need to. You can just tap into this network of financial coaches that have gone through and are certified Christian financial coaches, um, and they can help your church, help those people who really need that one-on-one. So I encourage you to check out uh, Christian Money Solutions and, of course, everything that Art's doing, and, and tap into that network. It's a great, great resource. And if, you're, if your church has a benevolence ministry, which I know many churches do, um, they often require, and, and rightly so, for a person to be able to receive financial assistance from the church to go through some type of program, to have some type of, of coaching or counseling. If you have a CERT CFC in your church, man, what a, what a blessing. It just kind of solves that problem. How can we ensure that we not only give somebody some financial support, but also provide them with the education necessary to make wise stewardship decisions moving forward. And so if you have a CERT CFC in your church, um, it makes that a lot easier. No doubt. That's the benefit is it can be used in different ways, not just for people who need help getting out of debt, but it creates that additional level of accountability Yeah, uh, that the church may not have the resources to do or the knowledge, honestly. As you know, when I was on staff as a stewardship leader, that was my main responsibility. It was building an army of coaches. I could do that. And I could tell you from personal experience, man, it's it's a huge undertaking, especially yeah. in a large church, to not only meet the need, which was always, we always felt like there wasn't enough people, even, you know, because the church consistently grew and we just didn't have the capacity to handle all the need. And part of that was because these volunteers were just that. They just didn't have the capacity or the ability to meet as as often as it was necessary. So that's why I think it's a great resource to to make available to the church. All right. Well, let's get into what we wanted to talk about today, which is the Christian Financial Health Report. Uh, first, give us an overview of why did you do this report? What's its purpose and why did you do it? And what's it all about? I'm laughing at that at that question. Why did you do it? Because the first thought that went through my head is because I'm, I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you saw the research process and how long it took to, to do all of this, then you would say, yeah, Art, you are clearly a nerd too, to dive into the data like, like you did. But the real reason is to simply help train and equip more people to be able to serve those that are in their church and even outside of their of their church. So this report comes out of the Institute for Christian Financial Health. So we talked about how the Certified Christian Financial Counselor Program comes out of the Institute for Christian Financial Health. This report comes out of the same institute. So the goal is to help people understand where Christians are today in the area of personal finances so that they can better connect with them, they can meet them where they where they are right now, and figure out how to better serve them, how to help them discover and pursue God's design for money. And so this just looks at the reality, like where Christians are today in the area of, of personal finances. And so that was really the the genesis of the, the report. We just needed to, we needed the data. We needed to figure it out so that we can help solve this massive problem that we have in our, in our churches with people, whether it's they're in debt or maybe they're not budgeting well, or maybe um, they're struggling with their retirement or, you know, maybe they're just financially stressed. We looked at a ton of different things in this, in this report. We looked at how Christians were feeling in general about their financial situation. We looked at their generosity. We looked at their debt. We looked at their retirement. We looked at their general savings. We looked at um, whether or not they did money management classes in church and how effective those classes were. We looked at whether um, they're using um, financial professionals, like who are they reaching out to for trustworthy guidance? And and does it even make a difference um, with who they're connecting to and who they're reaching out to? Spoiler alert, it does make a, make a difference. And so we looked at all of those things, and then the result was this 120-page report. We could have kept going, as you know, Leo. I mean, you can can just continue looking at data 
but at some point we had to stop. So it was 120 pages. For those that are visual learners, we have over 100 charts in there that illustrate the findings that, uh, that, that we came across. And so I'm very, very excited about this report and hopefully how it can serve your, your listeners and, and beyond. Yeah, I, man, you're, you're speaking my language. Uh, any of this information is extremely helpful, especially in the ministry of stewardship and generosity in the church, because if we don't know what people are dealing with or we presume something, um, then we may be offering the wrong solution. So I, I love this idea of having a deeper understanding. Of course, we know there are different organizations. We're one of them where we try to look at generosity and stewardship, mm-hmm. how our church is managing that. And mm-hmm. I think those are very useful. And some are reports, some are survey driven. But ultimately, we all are trying to figure out how to serve you know, the bride of Christ in this mm-hmm. area. This is a huge problem. Uh, finances could be a very difficult topic uh, in marriage and in, in relationships if we don't manage it well. And as you said, we're trying to figure out how do we help people in this situation? Yeah. You know, it's not always a money problem. We know that. A, a lot of times it's a hard issue. It's so many different things that come into it. So let's dive right into some of this data. I want to know what you guys have learned through this. I'm just going to let you lose art. Tell us everything you think is important. And then let's kind of land in the generosity space. I want to know kind of what does that lead people to? Because ultimately we know that we talk about stewardship and generosity. We know that stewardship, good stewardship will lead to generosity. For the Christian, generosity is the outflow of good stewardship, having margin, having a good financial system or or plan and belief about money that leads to generosity because we're kingdom minded. Yeah. So let's land there, but go ahead and, and kick us off uh, with some of the findings you've you've had. Well, Leo, I'm not going to only land there. I'm going to just go ahead and start there. Um, okay, because <laughs> even better. I, mean, we, I could only not do one episode on on generosity and the findings. We could do multiple episodes no doubt. on on the findings that are in in this in this report. So I, I want to start with a question that I think is really important uh, to have answered. And that's, do Christians really think that the Bible tells them to be generous with their money? I I know the the question may seem maybe um, obvious, but the wording of the question is is important. So Mm. do Christians, so we're asking the the participant here, do you, who who has self-identified as a, a believer, do you think that the Bible tells you to be generous with something specific? So we're not talking about being just general, generous in general. Mm-hmm. We didn't say be generous with your house, which you know, is a great thing to, to do, or be generous with your car, another great thing to do. We focused on something very specific. Does the Bible teach you to be generous with your money? And mm-hmm. that's an important question as we look at the reality of where Christians are today. Fortunately, 79% said yes I believe that the Bible teaches me to be generous with my money. That's a big deal to say that 79% of Christians agree that the Bible teaches them to be generous with their money. Of course, that means that 21% either um, did not agree, 7% did not agree, and 14% were ambivalent. Um, They neither disagreed or or agreed. But 79% said, yeah, I believe that that the Bible teaches me to be generous with Christians. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter for for pastors? Well, it matters because the people in the pew are not going to be surprised when you say, hey, the Bible says to be generous. Many ministers are hesitant to -hmm. talking about generosity and finance. It's not going to surprise them, your your congregation. It will not surprise them when you say that the Bible says, hey, you need to be, be generous with your money. They know this. And the same thing for certified Christian financial counselors. When they're sitting down with an individual or a a couple, this is important because most of the time they're working with believers and those people that are sitting across from them recognize, hey, this is something that the Bible tells me to do. It's significantly different to start the conversation with, did you know that God said, compared to, you know what God has already told you to do. Like that's, that's a completely different conversation. I consider the uh, the story of Elijah and the and the widow, you know, first first Kings, where God tells Elijah that he has already told a lady to give him some food. Now that's in verse nine, where God says, "I have already told this lady to give you this food." So when Elijah approaches the lady, 
he's not just saying, hey, you need to give me give me some food. He's directing her to do what God has already told her to do. He's reminding her of of that, which, you know, the ask was a almost a crazy ask, right? Because you, know, you can tell that because of her response, you know, I'm going to, I was just planning to eat this uh, with my son and then we were going to die. You know, wow, what a response there, right? Um, but what he did was he encouraged her to follow God, what God had already told her to do. The conversation did not start with, did you know that God said? It was, you already know that God had said. Once again, that's a different starting point. So it's important to recognize that most Christians, vast majority, already know that the Bible tells them to be generous with their money. Now, here's another question that I loved um, getting the responses from. Of course, I loved all the responses here, um, but we asked the question, do you actually want to be more generous? Hmm. Do you want to be more generous? So you know that the Bible tells you to be generous, but do you actually want to be more generous? Check this out. 46% strongly desired to be more generous. 33% somewhat desired to be more generous. So if you do the math, we're back to 79% said to some degree, yes, I desire to be more generous. 16% were ambivalent. And then only 3% had some type of negative response to Mm -hmm. desiring to be more generous. So we're looking at the vast majority of people in in our churches who, when we ask them, do you want to be more generous? They're saying, yeah, I actually do desire to be more generous. Of course, what we're seeing is this is just how God's wired them, right? This is part of God's design. God has designed us to be generous. And so we have this already wired with, within us from God. And so once again, this is about the starting point here, the conversation that you're, that you're having. You're, when you're teaching about money to, to people at your, at your church, or when you're sitting across from an individual or a couple, more than likely, they know that the Bible has told them to be generous with their money. And they have a desire to be more generous. You put those two together, that's, that's massive. That's a really big deal. And, and I'll go a little bit further here. So we asked a question about their financial stress. How stressed do they feel about their, about their finances right now? Those who felt the most stressed out about their finances right now were actually the most likely to strongly desire to be more generous. So even though they felt the most financial pressure, they also were the ones who were most likely to say, yeah, I really desire to be more generous. So we can approach this generosity conversation with confidence, knowing these two things. Once again, there is a massive finding in this report that helps us as we teach our church to be more generous. Mm, That's great. I love the, the the questions because it's so important to understand that not only do people believe that the Bible says to be generous, but they also have a desire to be generous. And this is something that I've experienced personally. I don't remember honestly one person that I've ever coached in all the years that I've done it where someone said, you know, I just don't want to give. Yeah. I just don't think I have to. I don't think it's required. It's an Old Testament thing, and I'm just not supposed to. Now, I know there are people against tithing, but the people that I've coached who were in a, obviously in a Christian church setting, most of them felt not, a, not an obligation, a desire yeah. to give. You know, So that fact is important because we should approach this with, we don't have to convince people so much. We just need to help them to be able to be generous. And I think sometimes we we tend to focus too much on trying to convince people of something they already believe and have a desire to do instead of just giving them the tools to do it. And we, of course, asked about their their church attendance. So we could see, you know, are you t- attending weekly? Are you attending a couple of times a, a month? Are you attending a couple of times a, a year, right? We, so we ask all of that information and we got a very um, broad response. As you would expect, these are your typical Christians in the United States. That's who we're. That's who we're looking at. And by the way, um, it was they were very geographically dispersed. So we're not just looking at the South or the Northeast or um, in Texas. You know, I know you Texans think that you're your own country. So I, you know, specifically said Texas or the or the West. They were all over the nation. It was almost split perfectly between female and male. So right down, almost right down the middle there. And then from an age range. It was very well dispersed. Of course, they were all over the age of 18, but once again, very well dispersed. 
And so that just helped bring the validity to the to the data. And so does some of those factors come into play? Yes, absolutely. But when you're talking about 79% mm-hmm. agree that the Bible tells them to, to be generous, 79% said that they desire to be more generous. Only 3% said that they don't want to be more generous in some way. Um, you know, that's, that's covering the vast majority of Christians, whether they attend church regularly or, or, or not. And so it's a, it's a strong finding. This episode of the Stewardship Leader Podcast is sponsored by Mortarstone. Mortarstone is an innovative platform tailored for church leaders, offering strategic resources to cultivate a culture of generosity within church communities. It provides insights into giving patterns and member engagement and enables church leaders to make informed decisions, personalize outreach, and nurture a spirit of giving. Mortarstone stands as a partner in ministry, transforming individual generosity into collective growth and meaningful impact for the church. For more information, connect with us online. Visit mortarstone.com. So share some of the other findings that you have correlated to what did you find was very relevant to their finances, how Christians look at it, uh, their debt level, their stress, all of that. Get, Get into some of that. Uh, before we go any further. Yeah. So uh, one of the findings was a, was a big shift in thinking for me. I expected us to find that non-mortgage debt level. So when we say non-mortgage, we're talking about the credit card debt. We're talking about automobile loan debt. We're talking about you know student loan debt. Anything that's not a mortgage, right? That's non-mortgage debt. I figured that we would see that non-mortgage debt levels would correlate with the percentage that a person gave out of their out of their income, their, the gross percentage that they that they gave, that we would find that the lower levels of debt would correlate with higher levels of percent percentage given. That was not found, and that mm. was really surprising to to me. And and I even looked specifically at credit card debt, and once again, there was not a a correlation at all. So just as as an example. For those that gave nothing, you said, I don't, I don't give anything, whether it's to the local church or outside of the, the local church, church, 46% of them had no non-mortgage debt. So these are people who didn't give anything in 46. So almost half of them had no non-mortgage debt. You compare mm. it to those who gave more than 15%. Only 12% of those had no non-mortgage debt. And so there was no clear correlation between the amount of debt a person had and how much they were giving. Now, this ultimately is going to end up being something that's very encouraging, but it was surprising because oftentimes we assume that if we can get people out of debt, then that will solve the problem. Then they will be then we'll be more generous. That that is the magic bullet, right? That will solve everything. But it's just simply not true, at least according to our research. So, of course, the question is: Well, okay, well, what if that doesn't correlate with greater percentage giving? Then what does? Well, what we found two very clear correlations popped up as we did our did our research: financial stress and sense of control. So those mm. were some questions that we asked in the in the section. We had a section dedicated to how they are feeling right now. Just how are they feeling about their financial situation in in general? And so we found that those with lower financial stress who reported lower financial stress and those who p- reported a greater sense of control that both of those correlated positively to the percentage that they that they gave. Now this ends up being once again really really encouraging because one of the key things that leads to greater sense of control, a lower stress, according to our research, was them having a plan. If they had a plan, then their stress is lower and their sense of control increases and then once again that correlates to and of course, correlation does not, I want to be careful, correlation does not equal causation, so I want to be careful there. But we saw the power that a plan had. Now, once again, this is going to be very encouraging for all of us because we don't have to wait until 
an individual gets completely out of debt for their generosity to increase. What we need to make sure that they have is some type of plan, whether it's getting out of debt or simply just um, getting financially healthy for the sake of advancing God's kingdom. We need to give them some steps. I was telling my parents this. Um, so I was having a conversation with them a few weeks ago, going through some of the findings that that really stood out to, to me. And this was one of them, because once again, this was a big mind shift for, for me personally. And I was going through this and they said, well, yeah, Art, um, of course. I'm like, what are you talking about? Of, of course. I've never seen research on this before. And, and my mom said, well, well, she, I can just tell you based on our own, own experience. And they told me a story that I had I'd never heard. She said that um, we were when I was in I think first and second grade, so when I was really young, um, my dad was a pastor of a small church that could not afford to, to pay him very much. Good church, but just simply could not afford to, to pay him very much. And so because of that, our family literally struggled to have food on the table every day. In fact, we would have to go to the to our own church's food pantry to have food on the table for some days. And my mom told me, now I actually knew about that part, but my mom told me, here's what I didn't know, that she would wake up most mornings just sick to her stomach, wondering how they were going to, going to make it. And then because of their financial situation, they had accumulated quite a bit of debt, um, specifically with some, some car loans, and these weren't nice cars by any stretch of the ma- imagination, um, but they had to take out loans in order to to get them. And I'll shorten the story here. The changing point for them was when they finally put together a plan and they said, look, we're going to get out of debt. We're going to figure this out. Let's put together a plan. And my mom said that when they did that, everything changed for them. Now, their financial situation, let me be clear how they felt changed. Their financial situation did not change, but Mm -hmm. how they felt changed dramatically. They felt less stressed and suddenly they felt a greater sense of control. And so when somebody does that, when somebody feels less stressed, has a greater sense of control, then according to the data, the likelihood of their, the greater percentage of their giving tends to be higher. Mm -hmm. And so once again, this is a big shift. So if you're teaching um, a financial health class at church, make sure you leave them with a plan. Like make sure that they have some type of plan in place. If you're a certified Christian financial counselor or you're some type of financial coach, make sure that they have a plan. I was meeting with a, with a couple. I do financial counseling in a private practice setting. So I was meeting with a couple and he told me, he said, you know, the most important thing that you've given me is simply just a plan. Mm-hmm. Because before I just didn't know what to do, what to, to pursue, what to step to, to take next. And now I do. And this has, has changed everything for me. Now, once again, his financial situation had not changed, but because he had a plan, he just simply felt better about it. So he felt more in control because he was more in control. And so um, make sure that you provide that, that plan. And even if you're teaching from the stage uh, and you're teaching to, to your church, make sure you give them some type of next step, some type of plan so that they can feel more in control of their finances. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's so important for everybody who's listening to, to understand is that sometimes we think, especially if we're in a church setting and trying to help people become generous, we sometimes think, well, if we just help them be generous, that will then kind of unlock not just generosity, but stewardship as a way of life. But we found many times that I think the data just kind of proves this, right? That people already have a desire and a knowledge of what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But they don't have the tools or the ability to do it. So helping people put a plan together, you're right. I mean, when people feel in control, then they can make a good decision, even on giving. I think the danger with pastors is that if they're just talking about generosity, but not providing the tools for people to become financially stable and yeah. have a plan and have that confidence and that peace that they need to have in their finances. And like you said, control, that's such a big, big, important thing that when they don't have that, then asking them to give, maybe that they actually will give, but they'll give more out of obligation. They'll give because mm-hmm. they think, well, gosh, if I give, then maybe things will get better. Maybe yeah. God will give us a raise. Maybe God will. And it's not a money problem most of the time. It's a financial management problem. They don't have the wisdom to know how to manage it because one, we're not teaching the biblical principles so that Mm -hmm. they're actually doing what God's word says and lining themselves up with the potential for blessing and favor and all those things that come from 
managing money that way rather than following the world's way of doing it. I'm just going to borrow, get through it, work overtime, whatever. This is such a crucial, such an important thing that we as Christian leaders can do for the Christian community is to say, God has given us this, this financial wisdom in his word, and we need to apply it. And the best way to do that is with a plan. Like, how do you manage well without a plan? Well, you can't. So I'm so glad that this research actually proved that a plan, not only does it affect them personally, give them control, give them the peace financially, but also leads them to generosity because they already know that they're supposed to be generous. They already understand what the Bible says. And again, have a desire. I love what this has uncovered because it's something that I think we all have experienced, yeah. but this just proves it that this is actually very, very much true. And let me just nerd out a little bit more here by providing some data points. So for those that said they felt completely out of control with their finances, 44% of those that said, I feel out of control right now, did not give anything. Like not not to the local church and not even outside of the, the local church. 37% of those who felt completely out of control gave between one to two percent of their of their gross income. So you put that together, we're looking at 81% hmm. of people that said, I feel completely out of control, gave two percent or less, and the majority of them giving nothing. nothing. Okay. Now let's let's go up to um, and when I say go up, I'm actually looking at, at, the, at the graph right now. I know you can't see it, but I can um, go up to the people that said, I feel in complete control. For those who said that they felt in complete control, only 5% gave nothing. And then only 11% gave between 1% and 2%. So once again, combine that together, we got 16% of those who said, I feel in complete control gave 2% or less. So we have 81% compared to 16%. So we're looking at each level of the sense of control, we saw increased percentages given. There's a very clear correlation here. So if if we can just help people feel more in control by giving them a plan, then that will do wonders for them. And you don't have to wait. Once again, I was very intentional by saying that they were already in debt, like or they were still in debt and they were giving. You don't have to wait until they're completely debt free to to be generous. They can start chasing after, and they will start chasing after God's design for money and generosity before they're even completely debt free, which is what God wants of us, mm. right? And so to make generosity a, a priority. And so these are just tools to help you, help the listener, help others follow God's design for money. That's all that this is. And so yes, it is. There's some very exciting findings here. I think what you just shared about. This idea that when people feel out of control versus in control, when they have a plan versus not having a plan. You know, I think about when my wife and I first got on a plan and we were in a lot of debt. I mean, that's what kind of led us to that. You know, we included giving right from the beginning because we're yeah. part of a local church. We believed mm -hmm. in giving to the church and we were tithing. Even though it's difficult, it never occurred to us, let's remove the giving in order to get our finances in control. We just assume that, okay, well, we're Christians. We put God first because we're learning not only about budgeting, but we're learning about uh, managing our finances according to God's ways, mm -hmm. right? God's principles. So one of those principles was you put God first. Everything yeah. comes from God. So right. when we embrace this idea, okay, we are stewards, when we just have to have a plan to steward better than we have because we've not been good stewards. Income comes in, you pay your taxes, right? That usually comes off before you get your paycheck. But technically, in our minds, it's like, no, the first 10% goes back to the local church, which is mm -hmm. us giving to God. And then we will manage whatever's left over after taxes. And that's how we created our budget. So it yeah. never occurred to us, and I know, you know, not everybody's here, and that's okay, but that's just how we were trained. So we didn't question. It was just something that made sense to us, mm -hmm. and it was biblical. We saw it in Scripture, so we're like, well, we're doing the right things. But I think what, what I want to emphasize in this is that when you make a plan and put God first— I think this is why you're seeing those big percentages of people giving when they feel in control because they've built it into their plan. Yeah. It's there. It's yep. like, I'm going to give, I'm going to save, and I'm going to spend. Yeah. Right? And by doing that, it helps us to be in control. And then, of course, that has its own positive benefits, right? We know, according to Scripture, that when we follow God's plans, we will have a blessing. We'll be protected. You know, we right. have God's favor, God's blessing. And I think more than that, we have God's wisdom. Sometimes yep. we can just say, well, I did this and God did that. 
yes, true, God is always present. He's always in our lives. But more importantly, he set guidelines, principles in his word that it says, if you follow these, the result will be X, Y, Z. And then I think with that comes this wisdom to be able to say, do I have the means? And how do I give more? How do I make the kingdom of God a priority? I believe people who go to church on a regular basis and hear the word of God and pursue the word of God in a relationship with God, I think that just makes sense to them. Yeah. But I think a lot of times what I found personally, Art, is that they just don't have a plan and no one, no one's ever sat down with them and said, here's how you do this. Yeah. Here's some practical ways to manage so that you're in control. You can eliminate debt, get rid of the stress. And I think that's what frees people to actually be good stewards. And then, of course, just the outflow of that is generosity. People will be generous in more than just finances, but certainly in finances. Yeah, there is a power and a plan. And, no doubt. Um, and so, first of all, find a good plan. It doesn't have to cover everything. You know, when we look at the eight money milestones, that's a program that Christian Money Solutions produce. There's eight milestones that you're chasing. Certainly, there's other financial steps uh, to uh, to take. So it's not completely comprehensive, but it provides a plan, right? And it starts with generosity. Money milestone one is to start giving and it ends with generosity. Uh, Money milestone eight, live more generously. Mm. And so provide some type of plan where there's like the eight money milestones or any of the other you know programs that are produced. That's good stuff to be able to provide them with some type of, you know, here's your next step. Here's mm-hmm. what you need to need to chase after. If you can give them that, that plan, man, that will benefit them immensely. And it ends up being a point of encouragement for me, knowing that I don't have to wait for this person who sits in front of me, or if, I, if I'm teaching at a church, I don't have to wait for them to get out of debt, to start chasing after God's design for money. Like I, to, I don't have to wait for them to get completely debt-free, to get rid of all their credit card debt, to see the percentages go up. Not because we're trying to, to fundraise or anything like that, but because we want something for them, right? We don't want something mm-hmm. from them. God doesn't want something from them. He wants something for them. To me, that's a very encouraging data point. All of this, to me, it, it ends up being just very encouraging to see as we try to help people understand God's design for money. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more of what you just shared. It's this idea that if we leave the generosity out of the process, especially early on, really what we're doing is just helping people with their money, mm-hmm. right? And and that's not a bad thing. I think financial education is absolutely important. But the difference between getting that financial education in the church is that you're getting the wisdom of the Word of God, which is yeah. transcendent. It will make a difference when the difficult times come. It, it will help you to stick to your budget rather than pursue the next thing. And I think that's very important for us as Christians to understand is like, there's a lot of financial education out there. You can get it for free. You can get it on YouTube. You can get it from influencers. The problem is that when it's not from God's word, there usually is some negative consequences to doing it the world's way. One is because you're never going to be satisfied. There's always Mm -hmm. a desire for more. That's something that we have to fight against. And when you embrace the word of God and put together a plan to manage that plan according to his wisdom, then it changes everything. Yeah, And generosity should be the outflow. I think if we leave the generosity piece when we're coaching people and say, you know, when you get to the point where you're financially able, then you can give. Well, they may never give. In fact, the yeah. statistics show that the more people make, the less percentage they give. Mm-hmm. Because again, we become dependent on it. We begin to fear losing it when we have a lot of it. And we want to help people from the beginning understand this is not your stuff. It's God's stuff that you get to manage and yeah. benefit from. Yeah. And I think that's a completely different education. So that's good. That's good. Well, well Art, I want to talk more about um, this. Uh, I don't think one, uh, one episode is going to be enough. So if you would agree to come on one more time, uh, I'd love to talk about how this specific report shows the difference between teaching this in the church and how does teaching generosity and stewardship in the church affect uh, some of this and and how do how do some of these churches could do that? Uh, so would you would you agree to come back and do that? Absolutely, absolutely. And once again, you can get this report by going to christianfinancialhealth.com backslash report. So it's christianfinancialhealth.com backslash report. All of this data is available to all of you. Um, you just got to go there. Um, it is a, there's a small purchase price tied to it, um, but it's at a very low cost for for what you get. I'll just I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Well, again, thanks, Art, for what you do. For taking on this, you know, sounds like a huge project, but I hope and I believe it will be helpful for Christian leaders and churches to understand their people better and yeah. take the right steps yeah. to help them uh, become financially free and financially more focused on doing things God's way rather than you know the world's way. So I'm excited about that. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And I want to thank you, for the listener, for being with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, would you do us a favor and one, just share with someone and two, give us a review, uh, rate this podcast so more people can find it. And if you want to know more about what Art's doing, go to Christian Money Solutions. He has a great uh, website with a ton of resources. You can find out more about the Institute for Christian Financial Health. And then, of course, about their coaching program. Uh, that is a certified Christian counselor training program. And, and I think you'll really benefit. If that's a desire you have to help people in this area and you're in a church, or if, if you want to do this as, a, as an outreach, something that you feel you could really help with, as Art said, many of the folks that have been through this program do it as a, a side business, as something that uh, they're passionate about. And so we had uh, Courtney Martley on Art not too long ago, and she's doing this full time and mm -hmm. building a you know a network of churches. And I know you two have worked together on that content. She's a cert CFC as well, and yeah, uh, yeah she uh, she provided some some great content for yeah. the program. So my point is, there's a network uh, and a community out there that's doing this. So if you're called to this, then connect with Art, connect with Courtney. This is something that they can help you to engage in. Uh, and then last, if you want to know more about our ministry, Christian Stewardship Network, you can find us at christianstewardshipnetwork.com. You can learn about our events, our community, our membership, and just become part of this network of church leaders who have a passion for stewardship and generosity, and specifically about offering that in their own church. Uh, we would love to come alongside you and help you to do that. Again, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Stewardship Leader. Stewardship Leader.